Why is prayer so important? Because prayer puts us in connection with God. We underestimate the power of prayer. You know, some mm. people think that prayer prepares us for the greater work, but mm. prayer is the greater work. And yeah. I think sometimes the reason is because when you pray, your hands aren't on it. You can't see an immediate change. Sometimes you have to wait, mm. and you wait in faith and persistence in prayer, and that moves the heart of God. All right, here with Pastor John Randall. I uh, just heard you speak on stage here at the Pastor Summit. And there's so many incredible speakers that are able to like pull something out of these pastors who happen to be parents as well. And everybody that just wants to see a revival. Before we get into the revival conversation, why is prayer so important? Because prayer puts us in connection with God. I mean, mm -hmm. we, that is, and I think, you know, it's unfortunate that a lot of times we underestimate the power of prayer. You know, some mm. people think that that prayer prepares us for the greater work, but mm. prayer is the greater work. And yeah. I think sometimes the reason is because when you pray, your hands aren't on it. You can't see an immediate change or something, you know, altered right away. Sometimes you have to wait mm. and you wait in faith and persistence in prayer. But God moves. I don't know how it all works. Yeah. I just know He said, pray. Mm. And and that moves the heart of God. So Man, to be a people of prayer is, is I think, what, what the church really needs to get back to. You know, the Lord said, my house mm -hmm. shall be called, not a house of preaching. He said, my house shall be called a house of prayer. prayer. So important. I think there's times, especially when we live in this crazy society, this crazy culture where it just seems like there's so much nonsense, there's so much hurt, there's so much division, and people are constantly asking, you know, why? <laughs> is this happening and not really praying prayers of God, how are you going to use this to strengthen our faith in you and lean on you more? How do you encourage people to pray prayers like that instead of praying the how instead of the why? You know, I think that's such a great question you ask. It reminds me of Isaiah chapter six, where Isaiah, mm -hmm. you know, it was, in the, it was in the midst of a national crisis, King Uzziah died and mm -hmm. it was like, this is the ruler that brought revival to the nation. He feared God. He walked in the paths of his father, David. Mm -hmm. But when he died, <clears throat> suddenly Isaiah says, I saw the Lord mm -hmm. and I saw the Lord seated on his throne. He was high and lifted up. And, and I think what happened is Isaiah <clears throat> had to get his eyes off of his circumstances and he needed to look up to heaven. Somebody said when the, when the, you know, when the outward look doesn't work, you know, try the upward look. It's yeah. like you gotta, you wanna look upwards because that's where the answers are. The answers aren't in the White House, they're in God's house. We gotta, we gotta mm -hmm. seek the Lord, he's on the throne. And so for me, I encourage our people, I encourage myself, Lord, you, you're still in control, I trust you. I, I be, you're working all things together for good. I just take hold of what he says and I pray it in and pray it out. You know. How do you encourage people to pray right now, specifically when we have an administration that doesn't align with our values? Oh, and I know yeah. I've had plenty of conversations oh, with yeah. people that it's it's hard to yeah. pray for your enemies or people yeah. you disagree with. Right. How do you encourage people to pray yeah. for those in leadership yes. right now, especially people that are adamantly against Christian values? It's so challenging, isn't it? Yeah. You know, I pray for God to remove them. <laughs> you yeah. know, honestly, like, yep. God, please, you know, we're, we are, you look at the, the result of the vacuum of leadership and bad leadership and ungodly, satanic even leadership, yep. I think we could say, Johnny. And I think uh, for me, I, I pray God remove them, you know? And sometimes I find the Lord checking my heart. And the Bible says to pray for those rulers that are yeah. over you. And Paul said that, and, and Paul was, these were the Caesars. They were the, they were the worst. And uh, They already actually killed the guy. <laughs> yeah, yeah, seriously, I pray for him. You yeah. know, but Paul also was in Caesar's household. And at one point, as a prisoner, he said, hey, listen, I got great news. Uh, those in Caesar's household greet you. People are getting saved. So I, you know, I just, I think we pray for them and uh, to get saved, but also Lord, remove them from power. And you know, what's amazing to me too, Johnny, I've been so encouraged by Daniel and his yeah. friends because when Daniel was there and God has ways of humbling leaders like Nebuchadnezzar, turned him into an ox yeah. for seven years. Nails grew out, hair grew out. I mean, it's like tried to warn you, man. I prayed that for <laughs> our governor. Said, yeah. I really have. Yeah. Lord, I said, Lord, please let this guy, our governor, California's governor, Gavin Newsom, I prayed for you. Great that you would have a Nebuchadnezzar-like experience. Yeah. And that's such a countercultural thing for people to hear, because especially on the other side, they're like, well, these people, we need to cancel them. Yeah. They should be uh, ostracized from society. I don't care about prayer. I don't care about having conversations. But here, 
at this pastor summit, it's just like, no, we want to see a revival, like yes. you said on stage. Yeah. And I think a revival starts with here. Can we just incorporate God in every oh. single aspect of yes. society, yeah. not put him on the sideline like, hey, we'll get this real quick. And then I'll let you know when we really need that that yeah. zinger, that cleanup hitter. It's like, <laughs> no, you need him right there. Right yeah. There. yeah. Oh, it's, I love that illustration. We do. We need the Lord every step of the way. And I think sometimes, you know, we think if we throw enough money at it, if we do this, if we do that, then we can create this machine and we can get it going and, and we can do that. And I'm not saying God doesn't use those things, but if you take God out of the equation mm. and he's not the main thing and, the, and you don't factor him in, then even if you do accomplish something, it'll be short lived. I mean, we, we need God. We, that's what our nation was founded on. Everybody knows that here. We preach that, we believe that, and, and we're asking that um, we want God involved. Talk about how you've seen God work specifically in San Clemente. Yeah. Because that was such an uplifting thing for me to hear that yeah. San Clemente wants to be an oasis yeah. away from the murdering of babies. What was what did that prayer look like outside of City Hall and everything? Yeah, a good friend of mine who's a city council member in our city, in light of the Roe v. Wade um, announcement that was made, wanted to make a declaration that our city would be a sanctuary city for life. And so he wrote a resolution and the resolution had the name of God in it several times. Yeah. And everything was, you know, and even the mayor voted to second it, to put it basically on the agenda. But suddenly LA Times got a hold of that and they yeah. read it, blew it up, it went national news. The next thing you know, what happens is um, Planned Parenthood's planning to come down. And so the, the mayor gets nervous. He calls an immediate meeting on a Saturday to get it voted off the agenda. Well, they, these people are highly organized. They all showed up in mass, Johnny. Yep. They showed up with signs that are vile. And I mean, just, and, and just the whole, it was, it was honestly, I, it was demonic. It was dark. Yeah. And I just felt like the Lord spoke to me that morning and said, I want you to go down there and I want you to stand. And I just prepared some comments. You get three minutes. I went down and we got, I mean, people were just chanting and screaming and like, there was probably a handful of believers. And I, when I say remnant, I mean like small remnant. Yeah. <laughs> and, um, so we show up, my wife and I are in there and we're sitting there just listening to the most vile, hate-filled things that you and I would 100% disagree with and that God's word 100% disagrees with. But we listened. Mm -hmm. I, didn't, I didn't interrupt them. Then it was my turn to speak. I got up, shared my comments, and in the midst of me talking, they were trying to shout me down. I had a microphone. Like, I didn't, and I wanted to like address them, but I'm like, no, keep talking, keep talking. Yeah. And um, unfortunately, and maybe, I, maybe some of my brothers didn't know, but I was the only pastor there uh, mm. in, our, in our community. And, and I don't know why that is. It doesn't matter. Yeah. I just know that I need to be obedient to do what God says. And, um, and I was booed out and shouted down. And I felt like, you know what? I'm always going to stand for life, no matter what. Yeah. No matter what. And I know when I was out in front of the Supreme Court, uh, I was there when yeah. Roe v. Wade got overturned. And it was an incredible moment just to see the joy on people's faces but i also knew that there were people on the other side that had an absolute visceral reaction to what happened and talking to them the the next few days it was so heavy and i'm sure you felt the same thing in san clemente where you know i just felt like i was called to prayer like every single time i went in front of the supreme court the conversation i had with people in there redefining these words and they're trying to justify the murder of innocent life and it seems like right now in this country we've heard so much about like protect the innocent protect the most vulnerable right and for some reason it just doesn't compute there right. and the only thing i can really the way best way for me to understand it is it's just satan at work and i just felt like that evil there and it's just like are they, do you feel like some people are just lost on this issue, yeah. naive on this right. issue? Yeah. Or do you feel like there is actually a lot of just plain evil out there and they know exactly what they're advocating? Well, I just want to say, first of all, that um, I really appreciate what you do and your boldness on the street. Yeah. I watch you, I'm like, dude, that guy's bold. And I, it blesses me. Yeah. I'm like, yeah. And just asking these questions, like walking right up to people. So, I think they're simple, they're simple it's questions. It's so good. Yeah. I really <laughs> love it. I watch you, I'm like, dude, I, this guy, I love it. And then, um, <laughs> And now to be friends is a blessing for me. Yeah. But um, I think, you know, the Bible says that the God of this world has blinded their eyes. Mm -hmm. In other words, I mean, there is a spiritual blindness over people's lives that um, is so palpable, tangible. I mean, it's, you could show them facts. You could show them the pictures mm -hmm. of the baby, of fertilization. And it's like, 
It's like talking to a blind person trying to explain a sunset. Uh, mm -hmm. I, it's just darkness is blind to their eyes. Yeah. And only Jesus, who's the way, the truth, and the life, can can open blind eyes. And that's what we pray for. Mm -hmm. And and that's what we do. And, and I think we just, in the meantime, if they don't see it, we still stand. We still yeah. stand for life. We still always. 100%. Final question then, you were talking about revival. And it seems like right now so many people's hearts are hardened, their eyes are closed, their ears are closed, they don't want to listen, they don't want to see, and it's not permeating their heart, it, it seems like. So do you feel like we are in the midst of a revival? Is a revival coming? Yeah. What is that going to look like? I can only speak from personal experience. And um, you know, during the COVID when it happened and everything, everybody knows what happened and churches shut down and, and we ended up, um, going into a parking lot for our Sunday morning service. We thought, hey, let's start there. Mm. Unbeknownst to me, all the churches around us had shut down and the mm. parking lot was open. And the thing just, Johnny, it just, it, ex it exploded. It exploded and for two years, in addition to meeting in our building, midweek and yeah. everything else we did, we, went, we, we just committed two years, we were outside. And only two days in two years did it ever rain. And when it rained, wow. we went underground because there's a parking structure, so we went underground and it was, it was wonderful. We called it underground church. People were yeah. like, are we going underground? <laughs> no, we're going to be outside. For two years. It feels like the stuff we hear about like yeah. internationally, like you got the under yeah. underground yeah. church in India and right. China. It wasn't like that. Yeah. It was more <laughs> under parking structure. But nonetheless, <laughs> um, you know, people started getting saved. We saw this and we really felt mm. that we were experiencing the Bible. And people would show up on the property and they would show up and just start bawling, like, because they hadn't had human touch, they hadn't heard the gospel, they hadn't wow. worship, and the Holy Spirit was falling. And we saw, I mean, we thought we saw so many people get saved, so many people get baptized, children also coming to Christ. And I mean, more kids that have, I've ever seen families coming to Christ, people getting off drugs. I felt like we were experiencing revival, but I'm, I'm not satisfied. No. Like, Lord, please continue, keep working. I don't want to do whatever you're going to do. So. Yeah, I, I think we, we've experienced some of it, but I think there's more to come. And I'm just being in places like this with like-minded people. Even today, talking to the crowd, there is a sense, there is a stirring. There is like, Lord, do it again, do it again. Mm -hmm. And uh, so I'm excited you know, for what God's gonna do. And that's why this place feels incredible. I know yes. you've gone to a lot of conferences. Sure. You've gone to a lot of round table discussions, yeah, yeah. but here it just kind of feels like, yeah. all right, maybe there's like bits and pieces we've been missing. Maybe yeah. we're trying to meet up with the same people who have the same yeah. uh, theology as us, right. but here it's like, you got people from oh, all yes. over the place. And it's even fascinating to hear for someone like James Lindsay, they're, they're like, what do you mean you got an agnostic here? It's yeah, like, right. no, this, this guy knows CRT yeah. better than anyone. And yeah. here's how it is already infiltrated the church and here's how we can come together. And I, I know, I'm a big Lord of the Rings fan. You seen Lord of the Rings? Yeah. I think it's almost like one of those, like the beacons are lit, uh, Gondor calls for aid. <laughs> yeah. And Rohan's like, you gotta get away from the idea. Nice. Like where were they you know, years ago when we were under siege? It's like, all right, at this time, we're yeah. in a war. Yeah. We're in a major yeah. battles. Let's come together. Let's figure out a way forward. And I think we're, there's so much more, I think that we're united on than divided. And we want to make, you know, we also want to make a big deal of non-essentials rather than essentials. Mm -hmm. Essential doctrines, you know, I think are, are critical to have unity. You can't, no. you can't, you can't have unity without on the if you don't have the essentials. The Ephesians non, model. Yeah, yeah, but on non-essentials, there's charity. I, you know what? It's okay. You know, um, we, we love Jesus. You believe in the gospel. I, let's let's yeah. work together. We, we we agree on this. So let's stand together, and we're we're stronger together than apart. Yeah, blessed by you. Oh, Thanks you so too, much, my John. brother. Thank you, bro. Thanks.